And uh, I'm actually going to read 18 verses here, but they're rather long. And uh, I don't know anything to do about preaching or teaching and except to pray about it and use the Word of God. And uh, I basically want to talk to you this morning about the snares of the devil. And so I thought 1 Kings chapter 18 would be a good example of people being snared. And of course, we're talking about Israel when we read in 1 Kings. In verse 21, and I hope you all pay close attention to the scripture. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? Well, if we were using this today, if I ask you that question, how many opinions are there today? These people, he's asking them, why are you halting between what God says and what Baal says? The false God, the false teaching that worshipped the Queen of Heaven and her son Baal. Ashtoreth was the Queen of Heaven, the pagan religion, and it still exists today, as y'all know very well. Religions. We have multiple religions today. They're all different. They say, no, they're just Catholic and non-Catholic. No, no, no. All the, there, there are different groups of Catholics that have different beliefs, and then there's all the non-Catholics that have all kinds of different beliefs, all kinds of opinions that don't come from this Word of God. So Elijah, he, he puts it to them. And he said, Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. So you see what I'm talking about? Let them therefore give us two bullets. And let them choose one bullet for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullet and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods, little g, and I will call on the name of the Lord, capital L, and the God, real God, that answereth by far, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. They're, they're agreeing to this. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullet for yourselves and dress it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your gods, little g, and put no fire under and they took the bullet which was given them and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal. B, capital B-A-L-L. From morning until noon. Saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is for he is a God. Either he is talking or he is pursuing or he's in a journey or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awake. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past and they prophesied until the time of the offerings of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired <coughs> the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. <coughs> and, to whom, excuse me, <coughs> and to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood and said, 
fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. He smoked the thing. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifices, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. And they said, The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon, and slew them there. He killed them all. <clears throat> then he started talking to Ahab. And the story goes on. You know, Jezebel got ate by the dogs in the street, and we can go on and on with the story, which I don't want to do. I look at the world we're in today. I don't know what each of you might think of it, but I think it's a total mess as far as God and this Bible is concerned. Most of it don't believe the Bible anymore. They don't use the Bible anymore in churches. They have fake things they call a Bible which are not and so on and so forth but I want to go from there to 2nd Timothy chapter 2 there's a man whose name was Saul in this Bible and God Almighty Jesus Christ his son spoke to him he was a man that was a, would you, I don't want to say he was the worst sinner that ever was, but he was right up there amongst us because he was a Pharisee. He was operating a false religion that killed Jesus Christ. They had him crucified. And then when the 12 apostles got the Holy Ghost and started their ministry, he fought against them, wanted to kill them, killed people that believed what they were preaching, put them in jail, had them whipped and beaten and all kinds of stuff. That's who this man Saul was. But did he know who Jesus Christ was when he spoke to him? Yes, he did. Because he knew this Old Testament scripture. He knew it real well. He was a Pharisee. He knew it. And when Jesus Christ spoke to him and said, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. He's talking about the scripture back there in Acts 9. And what did Saul say? What? He said, what wilt thou have me to do, Lord? He called him his Lord. Well, God saved a low-down, rotten sinner that day. He saved me one day. I was a low down rotten sinner. I still, oh, by the way, I still am. I can't change. So, oh, it didn't mean nothing to you. Yeah, it meant a lot to me. I changed a lot about what I'm doing and what I've done and didn't do and all kinds of stuff. Yes, but I can't get rid of this sin nature I have. And neither can you. You have it. You're born with it. You'll die with it. But Jesus Christ will save you. Amen. If you trust in what he did and not trust in what you do. Because what you do is you cannot do enough to satisfy God. You can't satisfy the Holy Trinity at all because you're not perfect. And God only accepts per perfection. And you can have perfection in the sight of God if you'll trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. 
It is that simple. It's so simple it only took me 10 years to figure it out <laughs> after I learned the truth. That's how bad the flesh is. I said, well, what were you doing? It wasn't that I was committing this sin or this big sin or this sin. No, it wasn't that. It was just that while I was a believer, I just had never turned it all over to the Lord. Never left it with Him. But when you do, it's the most wonderful thing that can ever happen to a person in this flesh is to know that Jesus Christ <clears throat> <laughs> He's got your back. He done paid it all. He paid for all the sins. All the sin of all the world was placed upon Jesus Christ when he was on that cross. And his blood covered it all. And he had the perfect blood of God Almighty. It was what was flowing in his veins. It wasn't Adam's. And it was a perfect sacrifice that was so perfect God could forgive all the sin of all the world, and I know people don't want to believe that, that it's not done yet, and all this kind of thing. Bless your soul, he can't come back and do it again. He ain't going to. You know why? Because when God raised him from the dead, he raised him in a perfect, glorified body that can never die. He's God. Jesus Christ. Anyway. The Apostle Paul, whom he saved there on the road to Damascus, he wrote 13 epistles that are in this Bible. They are the Word of God. They, they're trying to take them out of all the fake Bibles. They ruin them anyway. They might, it might not matter if they take them out. But the Apostle Paul says here in verse 7, Consider what I say. He say, well, I'm going to follow Peter. Or you can follow Peter if you want to, but that won't put you in the church which is the body of Christ. And I dare say, you wind up in hell. Say, well, I know people that follow Peter. Well, if they're saved, they follow the Apostle Paul. They might think they're following Peter. I don't. I can't. Un I can't understand. I'm not telling. I ain't trying to decide who's saved and who's not. I only. I'm gonna. Per I want to say what the Bible says. He said, "Consider what I say," and the Lord give the understanding in all things. Now, I can tell you, I was raised in a Baptist church. My father was a Baptist preacher. And when I was 33 years old, I thought I knew the Bible. I could sit in a tavern and drink beer and argue with people about the Bible, and I knew more about it than they did, most of them. But when a man showed me the, the word of truth, he showed me that the Apostle Paul's epistles were completely different than what Peter, James, and John, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had to say because all of that's for Israel. Israel had been set aside for a dispensation of time in which we live today. It's been some 2,000 years or so, somewhere in that neighborhood. By the way, the prophecy in the Bible is that it's 2,000 years. However, God counts time. But the Lord give the understanding in all things if you'll consider what the Apostle Paul has to say. He said, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Now, Jesus Christ is the seed God promised Abraham. Wherein he says, I suffer trouble as an evildoer. You still do. All the denominational churches today would consider me, and perhaps you, an evildoer because of what we believe about this Bible. But I believe the Bible. I know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in Acts chapter 2 does not pertain to me. I'm not a part of Israel. And that's who it was for. God intended. They had the opportunity. 
They could have believed God. They could have believed who Jesus Christ was. The kingdom could have been set up. We would have never been here. We would have never existed. But God knew before the foundation of the world what was going to happen. He knew Israel would reject him. They rejected God. That's why I wanted, I read back there in First Kings about it. Over and over again, God would straighten them out and get them back to worshiping Him. Wouldn't be 15, 20 years, they'd all be scattered again, be worshiping Baal again, because that was easier. They didn't have to go to Jerusalem. Do that, they could worship Baal anywhere. And that's what they did. Instead of going, doing that, obeying God, they just did it their own way. And that's why we probably can't count the number of so-called denominations there are here in the United States. I don't know about worldwide. We should go around the city of Arab, around Huntsville or Birmingham or anywhere. We wouldn't be able to count them. The difference of opinions. Why halt you between two opinions? Is Jesus Christ the Son of Almighty God? Is what he said here and what he revealed to the Apostle Paul, is it true? I know it's true because once I finally gave up on my flesh, the Lord saved me and all of a sudden I seen everything in a different light. I remember telling my wife about a month later, I said, you know, it seems like my mother and my daughter's attitudes changed toward me. She didn't say nothing. She just kind of gave me that look, you know. And I knew what I knew what the look meant. It wasn't them that changed. It was me. I wasn't fighting any longer. I wasn't wrestling with nothing any longer. The Lord had saved me. So he said, Paul said, I suffer trouble as an evil doer, even under bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake. Who's the elect? It's people God chose to save that Jesus Christ died for and paid for all their sins. The blood covered their sin. It's gone. God forgave it. He raised Jesus Christ up from the dead to prove it in the new glorified body that can never die again. So he says that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with <coughs> eternal glory. You see, salvation is not in a religious system. It's not. It's in Jesus Christ. Amen. And he says here, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Well, if I turn to 2 Corinthians 5, for example, it's not the only place it makes it clear in the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us. That means it holds, it's got a hold of us. His love for us, for all of mankind, it constraineth us because we thus judge or we discern something. And if one died for all, then all were dead. In other words, Jesus Christ was the sacrifice, the only one that could ever satisfy God. Could only one that had perfect pure blood that could cover the sin of the whole world and make God, when he accepted that, when he it covered the sin, God forgave it. God is then, if we read on in that chapter, he is reconciled unto the whole world. That means God's at peace with you He's at peace with me. He's at peace with everybody in this rotten, mixed up world we live in. That's evil as all get out. God's in, he's reconciled with him. Amen. I used to wonder why he didn't. And I've heard people say, well, God ought to just, he ought to just wipe Hollywood out. It's evil. <laughs> or Huntsville. Or Birmingham. Or New Orleans. It, it's got a bad name, you know. Why don't he just take it out? Get rid of it. Get rid of this evil. <laughs> Where is evil? 
what's in me and it's in you. Did God forgive all the people in all this world when Jesus Christ's blood covered their sin? Amen. Did he? I don't care how evil they've been. We know plenty of evil going on right now. All we have to do is watch the news or read the newspaper. We, know, we hear all about it. But God's reconciled. That's why we're still here. Because there's still some people in this world that Jesus Christ that's going to accept Jesus Christ. That it, his blood did cover their sin. That it's gone. They can trust in him. We don't have to halt between two opinions or 500 opinions or a thousand opinions. There's just one Lord. There's just one God. There's just one faith. There's just one baptism. There's just one truth in this Bible. There is just one church, which is believers. Amen. Just one. There's not a whole bunch of them. Say, well, you're saying all them people are lost. No, I don't know. I know people in that's come out of religions, different denominations that tell me they're saved. And they tell me that all they could do was trust in Christ. And I don't have any reason not to believe them. And on the other hand, they came out. They didn't stay in there. It says here, And all things are of God, verse 18, who hath, past tense, reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world. Do you understand what world is? What, what is the world? It's all the people. It's not the earth. It's not this business or that business or this city or that city. It's the world. It's people. <clears throat> Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now if God's reconciled to the world. He's not imputing sin to anybody. Hey. I, I'll explain it a little bit. I want you to. you have your Bible? Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, past tense, blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Not somewhere else. In Christ. That's where we're blessed. There's no other way. Now, according, or like in accord with, as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Well, how, how could God accomplish that? He couldn't without his son coming, being born of a woman. But he's got God's blood. And his son grew to be a man and carried out his mission concerning Israel giving them the chance to go ahead to be the person, to be the people that would be carrying a message to the rest of the world for however how much time was left. But they denied him. <coughs> they didn't take it. They, they crucified him, which God knew they would. And he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The only way this can happen for your sins who have been covered by that blood and God forgave them. You know what? People would rather think they can do something about it yourself. I did. I tried to stop sinning. Whatever that church I grew up in said was sin. I tended to believe that was sin. I wasn't supposed to smoke, drink, cuss, all these different things, you know, you go to hell for, lying, cheating. I heard that <laughs> sometimes every day of the week. And 
And I'll tell you what, until after I got saved, I didn't realize what kind of burden that was to carry, that I could not get out of my mind, that I'd more or less been brainwashed all the time I was growing up in, that you'd go to hell for lying or adultery or whatever, you, any sin you want to mention. They are sin. I mean, yeah. But once the Lord saved me, I was a whole lot of pounds lighter when I got out of bed the next morning. That's all I can tell you about it. That burden was gone, and I knew it. All that was stuff I couldn't do nothing about one way or another. You know, and I, and I know people stuck in religions that they're still trying to make repar reparations for the evil they've done and so forth, and thinking that's going to make them right with God. No, it's not. Jesus Christ already made it right. But we have to accept it. In all humbleness of mind, we have to accept that. He said he predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved in whom the beloved is Jesus Christ we have redemption we've been redeemed through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery or the secrets of his will, God's will. He chose us before the foundation of the world, before he ever created this place we live in, created mankind with rough people, people galore. I mean, we're overrun with people. And, uh, According to the experts, there were more people here before the flood of Noah than there are on the earth now. After all, they all lived eight, nine hundred years and kept having children. I can only imagine. <laughs> they said, well, I'd like to live back <laughs> I don't think I would have. I'd have died in the flood. <laughs> and anyway, there's snares. All these different religions. They snare people. They hook them. Sure do. And most people snare is they start, they'll go to some church, they're seeking peace of mind, they're seeking something, they don't know exactly what. So they go and they'll say, okay, we'll baptize you and make you a member and then we'll, here's the snare. And then we'll give you a job, we'll give you a position here in our church and you can, we all work together here now and all this sort of thing. That's a snare. And I know people that should be somewhere listening to this truth of this Bible, but they're not because they're snared. And they become beholden about it and so forth. It's, I think it's a, <laughs> it's a trick. They also teach them that you ought to be paying your tithes and many other things, you know. In chapter 3, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in the wrong book. Chapter 3, 1 Timothy. This is talking about somebody being placed in any position in a church, in a group of people. He says a bishop, verse 2, must be blameless, the husband of one wife, and that means one at a time. Don't let anybody fool you about it. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no. No striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre, 
<coughs> hope everybody knows what filthy lucre is. Right. It's bad money. <laughs> anyway, he says, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity, which is honesty. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride. He fall into the condemnation of the devil. And, and preachers do. I've known and heard about, I've known some and heard about many more, who when you show them the truth about rightly dividing this word of God, and they see the truth of it, and they know the truth of it, and they know that's what they ought to be preaching, but they won't do it because the church will fire them if they do. So they won't do it. And the end of these men is not funny. It's not funny. It eats them alive, so to speak. I mean, that's just the terminology, but it'll eat them up. They know they're standing in the pulpit on Sunday lying to people. They know it. But after all, they've got a house. With all the utilities paid, they got a high salary. They probably got a membership membership at the golf course. We can go on and on about this. So they don't want to give that up. Well, I'll tell you something. You better give up everything for the sake of Jesus Christ. He's not, but you're not asked to. But salvation through the work of Jesus Christ at Calvary is the most precious thing this Bible tells us about, and this Bible is the most precious thing that exists in this world. Amen. And yet people want to deny it for some kind of feel-good thing. Well, if you trust Christ as your Savior, there ain't nothing that makes you feel better than that does. Amen. Because that's eternal. And you know it. Anyhow, <laughs> he says... Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without, lest he fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil. The snare of the devil. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Go back to chapter 1. Here in 1 Timothy. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, and I'll start in verse 12 here. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer. He spoke evil of Jesus Christ. He wanted to persecute and kill and do whatever. Anybody believed Jesus Christ was the Messiah, Israel's Messiah. He put him to death. He put him in jail. He did all kinds of things to him. As a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. You see, he was an unbeliever. He knew the scriptures. He knew the prophecy. He didn't say because he didn't know. No, he said he did it ignorantly in unbelief. He ignored the scriptures to carry out his job as a Pharisee in the Jewish religion trying to shut off Jesus Christ, their Messiah, who had come, and they crucified him. And I, what do we say about his crucifixion? I say, thank you, Lord. Because I have salvation unto eternal life. Because when he died on that cross, as God Almighty knew he was going to, and Jesus Christ knew he was going to, he knew Israel was going to reject it. God knew they'd reject it. That's why I read first, first chapter of Ephesians a while ago. God foreknew before the foundation of the world exactly what would happen. He is God. And he says, <coughs> he, Paul did it ignorantly in unbelief. He knew the scriptures. He just didn't believe them. Jesus Christ 
it finally got to him so bad. That's why Christ mentioned that how it was, the scriptures were pricking him. Just eat, eating at him. He knew. He couldn't ignore it any longer. And he fell down on the road to Damascus and was blinded by the glory of the light of Jesus Christ who spoke to him. And he says, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He considered himself the worst sinner. You know why? Because he had ignored the scripture. He had it. Was he more evil than other men? No. But he ignored the scripture. So he called himself the chief of sinners. Some people say it just means he was the first one saved this way. Okay, it's all right too. He says, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy? Here's why the Lord saved him. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. Praise God, it's lasted 2,000 years. Amen. You and me have had the opportunity to be saved and have eternal life in Jesus Christ. For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. How about that? Scriptures, it's really good, you know. Paul, he goes on here to say, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern. What a pattern. He called himself the chief of sinners. If God could save a man who had been killing people for believing upon Jesus Christ, the Son of God, could he save you? Yes. He'll save anybody. What Paul is saying, nobody ever done worse than him. But Jesus Christ spoke to him, and God saved him. It's a wonderful thing. <coughs> Anyhow, over to Colossians 2, or back to Colossians 2, I should say, all in the Bible. In Colossians chapter 2, speaking of people being snared by the devil, in verse 6 of chapter 2, it says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. Now, Christ Jesus means he's the anointed Savior who owns you. I don't care if you don't believe the Bible, if you don't believe anything, or if you think you believe it all, or whatever. Jesus Christ is your Lord. He bought and paid for you when he shed his blood and died there on Calvary, and his blood covered your sin, and God forgave it for the, for the sake of Jesus Christ, so it would be righteous, and God is righteous in his judgment about it. And he raised Jesus Christ back up from the dead in a new glorified body that could never die again because all the sin was forgiven. Amen. So, you want to go to a church somewhere that's trying to get you to quit sinning so you can be right with God? That's what they do. Well, sin, sin ain't the problem. Ignorance sometimes is a problem. People just ignore the truth. Like the preachers I was talking about didn't know this truth of one preaching. Other people are blinded about it. Why? Because the devil wants to blind them. The devil thinks he still thinks he's gonna win. He won't admit he already lost. The victory was won when Jesus Christ came up out of come went up through the rock out of that tomb he was in. The victory's won. Sin ain't the problem. If it was, I expect this earth had been wiped out a long time ago. But I don't know. Anyhow, where was I? Okay. So, 
As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk you in him. Now this is, he says, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. You know, I, there was some preacher back 40, 50 years ago that I can't think of his name. He was well, he was a Presbyterian. And all he was honored all over the United States. He was this great philosopher, great great preacher, they said, and all this, that, and the other. And he taught people how to live right. Hmm. I wish I could prop some of you know him, but I call his name, but I can't. But it's he it said the philosophy and vain deceit. What is vain deceit? That's thinking you and your flesh can do something to please God. No. Not in the flesh. Now, you might do something while you're dwelling in your flesh that pleases God, but it's going to have to do with God's Word and in accord with God's Word that pleases God. And he says here, <coughs> after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Well, what's one, root, what one rudiment we're all obeying today? Well, we're meeting here on Sunday morning. Is that a rudiment of the world? It's not even the Sabbath that Israel had. No, no. Having somebody establish a new rudiment along the way. The rudiments, that's been, it's like being in the army and you learn to march. Jim, you've been in the army, did you learn to march? <laughs> you had to be in step with everybody else? Yeah. yeah, okay. That's a rudiment. If we're going to meet, have some singing and some preaching and some testifying, we're supposed to do it on Sunday. Somebody said. The Bible don't say that. We can do it anytime. So happens the world is so entrenched in all these rudiments, this is the best time we can meet folks. People most people don't work on Sunday. But we're not stuck in a rudiment. We can we can serve Christ and we can serve God Almighty and we can meet any time we want to. Anyway, he says, for in and not after Christ. You see, the, the, what, Paul's making a difference between all these worldly rudiments and this is right and that's wrong and all this sort of thing that religions do. They're instead of following after Christ and believing. He died. He died for all my sins. His blood covered my sin. It covered what I am. And it covered what you are. And yet people don't want to believe that. They would rather argue, and we would rather measure ourselves among ourselves as to who's right and who's wrong and who's doing right and who's doing wrong, rather than to accept what Jesus Christ did for us and did for everybody. And if you believe that, and you get the peace that passes all understanding that comes when you fully trust what Jesus Christ did for you, you don't worry about all them other things. You can't. You know, as the song says, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. And it says here, you're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. <laughs> and I think about how people get entrapped and ensnared in religions. And in the end, if you talk to them, they don't know what they believe. They really don't know what they believe. You know, I, I say that. I run into a woman out here at the door one day. I don't even know who she was. No, I, I'd have known then, or she might have told me who she was. I don't know. But her and some other woman was... Uh, Serving the Lord, they were out there with brooms and they swept the sidewalk all off all across the front. Told me that's what they were doing. And I talked to her about what I believe, what the Bible has to say. 
she agreed with every bit of it. But her husband was stuck in a church. <clears throat> She's supposed to obey her husband. And did. But I mean, there are people that see this truth. Maybe she couldn't take a stand for it, but she didn't have any trouble telling me that's what she believed. And I've run into a lot of people that way. I've run into men that was going to church where their wife wanted to, even though they knew the truth. Well, <laughs> how about uh, Well, I, mean, I better finish here before I go to something else. Anyway, it says, You're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Well, what did it? Circumcision is cutting around, cutting it away. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, did God cut away, do away with all the sin of all the world that was on Jesus Christ when he died. Amen. Yes, he did. And he says here, buried with him in baptism by identification. That's what baptism is. Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. He's talking to people who have professed that they've trusted Christ. He said, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in me, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, Israel and their kingdom that will be set up. But the body is of Christ, the church which is the body of Christ. It's of Christ. It's not got anything to do with Israel. And Israel has nothing to do with the church which is the body of Christ. And Israel would like to be part of it. They can trust in Christ in this dispensation, although they want to claim they don't even don't believe he was God's son. Even they're still looking for the Messiah. But anyhow, <clears throat> well done, read that. Well, I want to I'm going to go I'm, I don't, you don't need to turn there unless you want I'm going to go to Proverbs for a moment <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 18 Proverbs is the book of wisdom Verse 6 it says, A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth call up for strokes. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of it. The snare of his soul. People do get we, we we can get in trouble with our mouth, you know. You know, I I know I mention this quite often. I had a friend years ago I argued with him. I, I was lost. As, I was as lost as he was. But he didn't believe in God. No, no, he believed in God. He didn't believe in Jesus Christ. And I used to, I argued with him when I, we were drinking together. I argued with him after I quit drinking. He had to. I quit because I wanted to, and he quit because he had to, <laughs> or die. And so then I, I, I didn't actually argue with him again, but 
it was before I got saved, but I did talk to him about it again. And he still tell me the same thing. I, he could believe in God, but he couldn't believe this fairy tale about Jesus Christ. Well, he's three or four years older than me. Now I see on Facebook, he does believe in Jesus Christ. And I said, I'm thankful. I talked to him one more time after I started preaching. And he would still tell me the same thing. He, he just, he couldn't believe about Jesus Christ. But I guess, I hope somebody got to him because now he's saying he does. Why do people want to go on in ignorance? That's not stupidity. That's ignorance is ignoring what is actual fact facing you. The people want to ignore it rather than to face up to it. Why? Because of our pride. It's all because of our pride. You don't want somebody else to be right sometimes. You don't want to admit you're wrong. All kinds of pride enters into it. I know I have a real problem with it. I don't even like it now. I catch myself being prideful because it's a bad mistake. Because in the end, ain't none of us got anything to be proud of. Amen. Because we're all just alike in the sight of God. We're all born in sin. That Jesus Christ shed his blood and covered. And what a shame it is that we would let our pride stand in the way of us simply accepting that. I know what a battle I had with it. And it was pride. I can't say it was anything else. Where did I say I was going? <laughs> Maybe nowhere. But go to, I want to, I'll go back to Psalm 106 for a moment. I won't keep you all day. You'd probably get up and leave anyway. In Psalm 106. I don't know where to start reading, but anyway. <clears throat> Verse 13 says, They soon forget his works. This, this Israel's. Let's just talk about Israel. Why do you think about it? How soon? You, you think about Israel was down in Egypt in slavery. And God sent Moses down there that didn't want to go. But he went. Said he stuttered, so he sent his brother with him to talk. And all this sort of thing. But God put flags on Egypt. He ruined their crops and had frogs. I mean, we'd go on and on like done. Until Pharaoh finally had to say, all right, go. And Pharaoh thought he was God, you know. He was God. He was the ruler of the world. He was God. He wasn't accepting this God that Moses and Aaron was talking about. But after all the plagues and all the different things that happened, he said, all right, go. Then he got to thinking about it and said, ah, what's wrong with me? I can't let them go. So he took his army and chased after them. God parted the water of the Red Sea and Israel walked across on dry ground. And the army went in after them and the water came back over them and drowned them all. They spent 40 years in the Wilderness. Didn't wear out their clothes, didn't even wear out their shoes. He fed them with manna from heaven. He brought them water out of a rock. When they went in to take Israel, he parted the Jordan River and it stood up on heaps. Israel saw all of this. Then they got in there in a fight, they wouldn't fight like they're supposed to. God took care of it anyway. 
God he gave a part of it. He fought their battles. They knew all about God and the strength of God Almighty, and yet they rejected him for Baal. <clears throat> they would turn, he would straighten them out. A few years, they'd be right back in the same condition. They would have, they built their altars of sacrifice and they sacrificed the devils and all that. What, the whole Old Testament's about all that. God is long-suffering, and he's been long-suffering with people like you and me for 2,000 years now. And I don't know how much longer he's going to be long-suffering. But he knows. He knows exactly who who will be saved and who won't. Anyway, it says, They lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert, and he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. They envied Moses also in the camp, and Aaron, the saint of the Lord. The earth opened and swallowed up Nathan. I don't know if you've ever read that story or not. When the earth opened up and swallowed Nathan and his family, them right into hell and that people could stand there and look at hell when he dropped them in there. I'm talking about what God showed people. It's in this Bible and yet people don't want to believe it. Anyhow, he says, and, and covered the company of Abiram and a fire was kindled in their company the flame burned up and lit the wicked, up the wicked. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molten image. Thus they change their glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. Baal. They forget God, their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said that he would destroy them, had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. And Moses convinced God not to I'm saying, God, you did all these wondrous things and whatever, now you're going to destroy them? People will never believe it. They won't never believe in you. So, <coughs> so God repented. It means he changed his mind. I'm sure he wasn't going to do it anyway, but that's neither here nor there. But anyway, he says, Therefore he said that he would destroy them had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. Yea, they despised the pleasant land, they believed not his word, but murmured in their tents and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Therefore he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their seed also among the nations and to scatter them in the lands. They joined themselves also unto Baal Peor and ate the sacrifices of the dead. Thus they provoked him to anger with their inventions and the plague breaking out in time. We can go on with this. How Israel, all the miracles and all the wonders he showed them. You think about it. Jesus, Elijah did marvelous things like we read about. And then when they told him Jezebel was going to hunt him down, have, have him hunt him down and killed him, went and hid in the cave. But Elijah came back out, you know. All of that proved that he was still a man. Still had the same shortcomings everybody else did. Eventually God sent a chariot in flame to come down and take him to heaven. He didn't die. He's a great God. Anyhow, <laughs> this goes on and on. And they angered him into wires of strife and went ill with Moses for their sake. Moses got so put out with him. He struck the rock, rock himself and commanded water to come out of it a second time. Therefore, Moses died. Didn't see the promised land. No. God ain't nobody to fool around with. 
especially ought not to reject his son. Anyhow, we know people think God's unfair. Now, how could he be more fair than he is? And it does rain on the just and the unjust alike. We don't have any promise of tomorrow. None of us do. You ought to think about that. Because the time might be very short for all of us, or it might be very short for you as a person. And there's always, it don't take but a moment to trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And But you've got to believe it. There's no way around that. You've got to believe it. Anyway, I thank you all for your time and attention this morning. I appreciate you all being here. And so, I hope, hope to see everybody again. I really do appreciate you being here. Uh,